uh, got a scholarship to Linda Lane College. Intelligence. Every child has an unknown potential for it. Pit. Plie. But how much can be taught and how much is set at birth? Good evening. I'm Dr. Timothy Johnson and this is Nightline. You can have all the breeding you want. If you don't furnish the environment, you have nothing. The debate is between nurturing and nature. But either way, are parents running the risk of putting their children under the kind of stress that could lead to burnout? That's our focus tonight. This is ABC News Nightline. Substituting for Ted Coughlin, reporting from New York, ABC's medical editor, Dr. Timothy Johnson. Most parents will go to great lengths to give their children a break, a head start, an advantage. But when it comes to intelligence, there is considerable controversy as to just what parents should do, how far they should go. Part of the issue, of course, is that we don't know for sure what it really means to be intelligent or how to help our children achieve it. However, as Jay Shadler reports, that hasn't stopped some parents from going that extra mile. We definitely wanted to start a family. Adrian and David Ram had a problem. David couldn't get me pregnant because he was sterile. Dr. Robert Graham and his Germinal Choice Sperm Bank has a mission. We're trying to produce the best humans that man knows how to produce today. Together, they created Leandra. We know that she's, she's come from good stuff, you know, but the way she relates to people and um, her empathy and her expression, they, they all seem so knowing and, and come from a great place. Actually, Leandra comes in part from a great tank of liquid nitrogen. Inside, color-coded vials of frozen sperm from voluntary donors with elite pedigrees and extraordinary IQs. IQ 145 at age 12. IQ 147 at age 7. We get the donation in a vial such as this. Now, someone chooses it, we then send it to them in a container such as this. I'm sorry, Leandra, that's true. Instead of the stork, <laughs> you came in here. Essentially, it's, it's quite simple, elementary. But, of course, it's, uh, it's fundamental, too. Fundamentally controversial, that is. After all, the repository search for accomplished donors with high IQs is more subjective than scientific, usually beginning with a quick look through who's who for potential donors and ending with Dr. Graham's judgment. You can't really breed intelligence as such, but you surely can stack the cards, so to speak. Since Graham's nonprofit sperm bank began six years ago, it stacked the deck and shuffled the genes 25 times. It has worked every time so far. We're, nobody's entitled to expect success 25 out of 25. But that's the score. Success in what sense? And th these are super normal, everything in their favor youngsters. Hey, yo-yo. What's yo-yo? What, what letter? Why? Good. Leandra's no exception. At two, she's verbally precocious, physically agile, and mentally quick. Each of these tanks holds between a three and six month supply of donor sperm. Today, there are 12 approved donors here. For instance, in this tank over here are the genes of a scientist. This one here, a successful businessman. And this tank holds the genes from an Olympic hero. All of these men have IQs well above normal. Breeding a society of intellectual thoroughbreds has a long genealogy of its own. If Plato could think the idea had some merit, why not the Rams? Well, it seems to me that if we can uplift the, the average of, uh, of this society, that can, that can only be a benefit. If it were only that simple. First, there's the Herculean task of defining intelligence. Was Einstein smarter than Picasso? Was Mozart brighter than Lincoln? And what does the intelligence quotient, IQ, really measure? A natural gift, a nurturing debt, or both? At best, intelligence is a complex set of ingredients with no one owning the recipe. Despite that, a lot of people are still trying to cook up ways to improve their children's odds for a brighter future. If Robert Graham thinks intelligence can be bred in the laboratory, 
Other people believe that it can be raised in the home. Four geniuses have been raised in this house, all with IQs over 154. Uh, Johanna, uh, she started school in the third grade. She skipped kindergarten, first and second. Stephanie started reading uh, at nine months. She was reading very well. Stacy's 13, and she's uh, got a scholarship to Munda Lane College. And then there's Susan. I went to kindergarten for three days, and then they put me in first grade for a week, and second grade for two weeks, and then they did some tests, and they go, well, you can be put into sixth grade. But that, that was 10 years ago. Today, she's 15, a college graduate, working on her Ph.D. in anatomy. How strong a role did your mother and father play in making you a 15-year-old postgraduate student? I think, I think it was like, you could say it was all due to teaching. I fastened a card uh, on the back side of the high chair. From the moment of their birth, Mrs. Susedic has been gently teaching her children with flashcards, books, and songs. My method goes step by step, and we go very surely. And start so very he, early. Right, very early, before that child realizes what's going on. Joseph Susedic, a retired machinist, even claims to have begun the girl's education before they were born. The fifth month of pregnancy, because there we started teaching, reading, spelling, the alphabet, uh, numbers. What do you say to the people who argue intelligence is a matter of breeding? I'm saying that it's environment. You can have all the breeding you want if you don't furnish the environment you have nothing. Ultimately then, the old nature-nurture arguments seem very much alive, carrying with them both the promise and puzzle of an unknown future. It might be more comforting to end this story of intelligence on a more definitive note, but that probably wouldn't be wise. Jay Shadler for Nightline in New York. When we return, we will focus on the nurture side of the intelligence equation, what we should do with whatever we have inherited. We will talk with Glenn Doman of the Better Baby Institute, who advocates intellectual training at a very early age, and with Dr. David Elkind, president of the National Association for the Education of Young Children, who feels that early training can, in fact, backfire. This is ABC News Nightline, brought to you by Ralston Purina. Hi, I'm Eddie Payton. My brother Walter holds the all-time rushing record in the NFL. So lots of investment firms would love to tackle the job of managing his money. But one firm works just as hard for people like you and me, Dean Witter. They're helping me save on taxes and plan for the future. You see, with Dean Witter, you don't have to be a Super Bowl champion to be treated like Sears Financial Network. Next on The Judge, a man wants to be more than just a biological father. But you became a surrogate father by your own choice. Now his custody battle threatens to separate an orphan boy from his loving grandparents. I'd do anything for that boy. But is the motive love, or is it really the boy's million dollar inheritance? Judge Robert J. Franklin wants to know. Answer the question, Mr. Johnson. Yes, sir. Right. You'll find out on The Judge. Watch The Judge, weekdays at 5.30 on WHTF. Can you pass this test about mental retardation? True or false? You can prevent mental retardation. True. How can you help? Help Build the Ark. The Association for Retarded Citizens provides information about diet correction, prenatal care, and postnatal tests to thousands of pregnant women, and with your help can do more. Won't you help build the ark? You're the answer. Who will get baby M? The landmark decision, its impact on surrogate motherhood, and reaction from around the country. Tomorrow on ABC's World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. Joining us from our Boston Bureau is Dr. David Elkine, professor of child study at Tufts University. And from his offices at the Institutes for the Achievement of Human Potential in Philadelphia is Glenn Doman, a well-known advocate of accelerated learning in early childhood. 
Mr. Doman, since you are an advocate, in fact, I would like to ask you two questions about that position, um, both of which I hope you can answer in relatively short form. Number one, what is it that you precisely do advocate? And secondly, what kind of proof do you have that doing what you advocate makes a positive difference in the long run, that is, by the time a person reaches adulthood, a uh, contributing member of society? Sure. Uh, what we do is teach parents to teach their children to do everything at very young ages. Uh, it is the, the younger you teach a child, the easier it is for him to learn, right down to birth. Uh, and uh, what proof we have are the children themselves. We, we're clinicians and we deal with children and parents all day long. Uh, I've got 100,000 letters from mothers from all over the world telling me what happened when they taught their babies to read and to do math and so on. All right, I guess the medical scientist in me would want to know what happened to the group of children that you train or that are trained in your method versus another group that might not have any particular training. And what happens to these two groups when they reach adulthood? Are the group that is uh, trained according to your method clearly superior to the other group? Do you have any data or proof of that sort? Um, what happens to the children? Sure. Um, we, uh, we wrote How to Teach Your Baby to Read about a quarter of a century ago, and many of those children are in their 20s now, um, some in medical school and so on. Yes, they've done very nice Any things. comparative studies to other groups that didn't receive any special training? Um, no. Okay. Uh, it, it, it's not our bag, Dr. Johnson. Okay. We're clinicians. All right. Dr. Elkind, uh, do you have any question about this kind of method in terms of the proof available or any questions about uh, potential hazards of this method? Yes, I do. I don't, you know, I think it's very clear that if, if uh, this is going to be sold to parents as increasing children's IQs and making them uh, more successful people, that, that some clear-cut evidence ought to be presented and the sort that you suggest with control groups and so on. I don't think we have that and I think there are, there's no evidence that the system works. There's some evidence that it may do harm. After all, we're living longer. Why hurry children up? Uh, they have a long time. We are, uh, and why focus on intelligence? Uh, whereas we're really, a, really a service economy these days. 70% of our population are service industries. Uh, we need people who have social skills and social abilities. I'm not saying these children are not learning that, but the overemphasis on intellectual to the ex at the expense of personality and social skills seems to me uh, misguided, particularly in our, t in our society today. So well, we'll come to that question of other forms of intelligence, but I guess many parents would, would ask this simple question. Uh, if there's no good evidence of long-term harm from the kind of methods that Mr. Doman advocates, why not... Uh, why not play it safe, hedge our bet, and give it a try? Well, because there are risks involved, and I think that, that um, Mr. Domi really should make it clear to parents that there are risks involved. We know, uh, as clinicians and as uh, uh, pediatricians, psychiatrists, child clinical psychologists, there's a great deal of evidence that the wrong kind of interaction between infants and their parents can lead to long-term problems. Eric Erickson talks about the sense of trust in infancy. It's hard for me to see how a parent showing a child flashcards is going to encourage that child's sense of trust, my sense of that more likely it would encourage a sense of mistrust, that it interferes with the kind of healthy parent-child relationships that I think are so essential mm. to those early years. I don't think that uh, the orientation towards right or wrong, towards teaching a young infant, is the right orientation a parent should have. It seems to go against all that we know well, that is good parenting and healthy parenting for young children. So I think there is a very real danger that parents may interfere with a, the kind of relationship that uh, I think all uh, clinicians, uh, except I suppose Mr. Doman, uh, believe are healthy for, well, for young children. Well, let me interrupt and ask you the question I asked Mr. Doman. Do you have, in fact, any long-term proof that children subjected to this method do suffer some consequences ill toward? Are you t talking to me? Yes. We don't have that kind of evidence, but we do have a lot of evidence about children who have been, uh, who have been uh, dealt, sort of neglected or dealt yeah. with in a kind of uh, direct way or have been, you know, not interacted with in a positive, warm kind of right. way. Right, but he's and advocating, in fact, yeah. intense interaction. Pardon me? He's advocating, in fact, intense interaction. Right, but of, of, of a course. different kind. Okay. Yeah, but of a different kind, yeah. Mr. Doman, are you concerned about these risks? Um, I have a very hard time understanding what Dr. Elkind says. Uh, I have lived nose to nose with 15,000 children and 30,000 mothers and fathers. Um, I've, been doing, I've been doing it all my life, sir. And, and if I ever see any of those dreadful things that Dr. Elkind is afraid will happen, we'll stop doing it. All right. Well, I've talked to some of the mothers who have been in your program and dropped out who are very concerned. 
And so there, it's not 100% by any means. Name, nameless, doc, nameless Dr. Elkind. Pardon me? I always worry about nameless people and nameless... Well, I don't, you're worried about nameless people. You've got these 100,000 letters. They're all, oh, no, they, they all have names. Well, they, they all, all have names, Dr. Alcon. Let's hear them. Okay. Then let's you you don't really then expect me to read you 100,000 names. <laughs> I'm gonna, you're asking I'm, me for names. I'm going to interrupt to suggest that uh, when, when we return, we're going to be joined by Dr. Irving Siegel, who is a researcher on intelligence and testing for the Educational Testing Service of Princeton. We'll put some of these hard questions to him. This is one popular approach to car design. It's an approach Honda has never taken. Perhaps that's why the Civic hatchback, with its low hood line and long roof line, is so distinctive. Very tasty. Here, Caleb. The biggest news round these parts is Pepperidge Farm's new American collection. Big, generous cookies simply bursting with lumpy, bumpy personality. Whopping chunks of rich chocolate and nuts are hidden beneath each lump and bump. My favorites are the Chesapeake and the Sausalito. Hey, <laughs> they've got more personality <laughs> than most folks we know. <laughs> People are tuning in to Today's Business for more than just business news. For Consuelo Mack, respected news editor and anchorwoman with over 10 years of financial journalism. Texas Monthly points the finger at New York. They claim New York oil traders have sent oil prices crashing. For Chief Economist Bill Wollman, renowned author, business analyst, and economic commentator. It's going to continue to be slow growth. The buck starts here with Today's Business. Weekday mornings at 6 on WHTM. We don't know why or where or when disasters will shatter lives. We do know why we're there. To put the pieces together. To reaffirm life. The Salvation Army. There because you care. But I want to tell you something important there. Very often, and I do not mind if I sound like a broken record, very often I say to a person, can you talk to your priest? Can you talk to your minister? Can you talk to your rabbi or a therapist? Because very often these are not questions that can be solved over the air, but what can be done over the air is to say, do something about it. For the truth, ask Dr. Ruth. Weekdays at 9 on WHDM. The Pope is on the road again, this time to South America. It could be one of the most difficult trips he'll ever make. Tomorrow, watch ABC's World News This Morning before Good Morning America. I'm Charles Gibson. And I'm Kathleen Sullivan. Tomorrow, the Academy Award winners. And the NCAA basketball winners join us. Yeah, we hope you will too. Tomorrow on Good Morning America. Joining us now from our New York studios is Dr. Irving Siegel, Distinguished Research Scientist with ETS, the Educational Testing Service of Princeton, New Jersey. Dr. Siegel, we seem to be a little bit awash here in stories of benefit on the one hand and of harm on the other. Can you uh, rescue us a little bit with some hard science about whether, in fact, early training is good or bad? Well, <clears throat> I'm not going to do too well in rescuing you in terms of hard data. We don't really have very strong evidence one way or the other. Uh, you can't accept letters from parents uh, as evidence in any kind of hard sense. Being a clinician does not excuse you from providing more specific statements. You see, one of the interesting things is kids who grow up in ordinary families also go to medical school and also learn to read and also learn to succeed. So the question really becomes on what, to what advantage is this kind of early training? We well, do know. Go ahead. Okay, on that specific question, I guess all of us have an intuitive sense that if you intensively train a young child, they might in fact test better than another young child who isn't intensively trained. The question, of course, that parents would have is, by the time they reach school age or adult age, will it really have made any difference? Doesn't it tend to level out? A lot of it does yeah. level out by the time the kids are in fourth and fifth grades. One thing we should make clear, 
that teaching a child to read or to do arithmetic and all these things very early does not speak to comprehension of understanding. We're not talking about training children to be able to be <clears throat> uh, kind of automatic responders Rather, we want them to be understanding of events. So you can read like a mechanical person. It doesn't mean you comprehend. I think the thing I haven't heard oh, discussed... Oh, that's nonsense. Uh, it is Just a minute, Mr. Dolman. We'll give you a chance. I think he's had his turn. Uh, what we're talking about is children develop developmentally at rates which they can comprehend. We have a lot of evidence that children learn to read as a skill, but not read with comprehension. It depends on what your objective is. If the objective is to understand what you read, then what becomes important is teaching a child to read when he is intellectually or developmentally ready for that understanding. And I think this is a very important distinction. You can get a very young child to recite the ABCs. He has no sense of sequence. All right, Mr. Doman, uh, on this point, what about the issue of comprehension versus rote learning in terms of the kind of methods you advocate? Sure. Without comprehension, it isn't learning, it isn't reading, obviously. Uh, the problem is all the people complaining have never seen these children, they've never been here, and by and large, they've never read our books either. Uh, and oh, they yes, really I've read your book. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, well, who's speaking up about the book here? Uh, I, no, I've read oh, this book. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and I'm not convinced. I mean, there's no hard data, there's no science in any of those books. Uh, Bless there, your heart, son. There is, uh, no, there is not one reference in any of your books. There's not one reference to any study, to any scientific, <laughs> to any child development data. Uh, look. There's not re reference to, uh, to uh, pediatricians, to Piaget, to Freud, Are we to ever anybody. Are we ever going to get to respond to <laughs> yes, Mr. Dolan, all, this, all this yeah. jazz? Although I, too, I am mean, interested it, in the kind of scientific the data that offers proof, and that's, I guess, what I was asking about earlier. Uh, there's not uh, one if, reference if, to one, one uh, study uh, in any of those books. Okay, Mr. Doman, uh, response. The, 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 the test of whether you can read is reading. But wait a minute. The test of whether you can play the violin is playing the violin. You said you never read your the, books. I said you, I've read your books, and I said there's not well, one Well, you didn't understand them, son. Pardon me? You didn't understand them, obviously. Well, but, but that has nothing to do with the reference. The, look, they, about are, the only proof, and, Dr. Johnson, the, the, I invite you to come here... I invite you to look at the 100,000 letters, but most of all, I invite you to see the children and their parents. Okay. On this issue. charming, delightful, highly intelligent children. Okay. On the issue of evidence and anecdotal evidence that we're talking about, I, we seem to have reached an impasse. Dr. Siegel, I have another question yeah. that is obviously raised by the piece we saw earlier and that Dr. Elkind referred to. Are we making a mistake by emphasizing the traditional intellectual skills in all of our discussions, that is, linguistic skills, logic, math skills, to the exclusion of all the other kinds of skills that often make people very successful adults? I think that's a very important point. I don't want to get into the polemics of the previous discussion because there are a number of misstatements that have made that I think should be publicly stated. Uh, if you want to know what they are, just we, we were not able to go to see Dr. Doman's uh, operation. You weren't allowed in? No. Uh, uh, are you, uh, I, I, beg I, your I just pardon, don't want to get off onto this anymore. No, that, that's just untrue. Because, well, you Flatly untrue. Speak to CBS and Walter Cronkite's program and he'll tell you all about it. All right, back to the issue back of intelligence. Back to the issue. The issue, is, <clears throat> the issue is that what we're really dealing with here is a narrow focus in what intelligence is. If we want to talk about intelligence in a broad sense, we want to think of, in general terms, what individuals are capable of doing, how they're able to solve problems, how they're able to enrich their own lives through exploration, through automated, sort of a sense of autonomy in how one moves around. Mm -hmm. I think this emphasis on the basic skills of math and reading preclude the child entering into areas mm -hmm. of art and music with the kind of enthusiasm that we'd like to see. Okay. And to what end? You see, life is more than just math and science. All right, on a practical note then, when we come back, I'd like to ask each of you very briefly, because we have very little time left, to offer sort of your one bit of advice to parents as to what they could best do during those preschool years to achieve some reasonable normalcy of learning. And we'll ask you all to do that when we be back in just a minute. Let's 
For the highly motivated forever on the run, NEC introduces Multispeed, the world's fastest portable computer. It has the most advanced LCD screen and even does Windows. It's PC compatible too. So if you're on the proverbial fast track, there's only one thing to do. Take the Multi and run. Cadillac Seville for 1987, an unmistakable statement of success. Its elegant design surrounds some of the most remarkable engineering in Cadillac history. Engineering designed to enhance your comfort, your control, and your confidence with impeccable manners on the road and a new longer warranty, all the while reminding you that Seville represents the ultimate in American luxury sedans. Seville, the elegant spirit of Cadillac. You know, I'm not easily annoyed, but I never liked the way the vegetables always fell off between the sirloin on my beef kebabs. I fix that. I don't put vegetables on my beef kebabs. In fact, I believe that's why someone invented salad. Beef, real food for real people. There are winners and losers in sports competition. Today's losers are often tomorrow's winners. But with drug and alcohol abuse, there are no winners, only losers. It just doesn't make sense to spend years developing your body just to abuse it with drugs or alcohol. As coach of the Harrisburg Cougars, I try to pull all my players together to win the game. Teamwork makes a difference on and off the field. Team up with me, Carl Rachelson, and together, let's do something about drug and alcohol abuse. Team up against drugs. Us once again are Glenn Doman, Dr. David Elkind, and Dr. Irving Siegel. As I requested before the break, each of you in about 20 seconds, what would be sort of the bottom line advice you would give to parents in those early years? Mr. Doman first, please. Yeah. Uh, parents, you can teach your babies absolutely anything you can present to them in an honest and factual way. And there's a perfect fail-safe law. If you're not having the time of your life and the baby isn't having the time of his life, stop because you're doing something wrong. Okay, Dr. Elkind? Yes, I'd like to emphasize that uh, uh, an ounce of motivation is worth a pound of skills any time. Providing your child with a rich, stimulating environment which you're excited about learning, giving them that excitement and enthusiasm about learning is much more important than learning any particular skills. Okay, and Dr. Siegel? Engage your child in good conversation, treat him like a human being that he can understand, realize he thinks things differently than you, give him a chance to explore, but get involved in dialoguing. Talk to him, ask him questions, and let him ask you questions. All right, one, one further question for you, Dr. Siegel. We have about 30 seconds left. Are there any practical ways in which parents can recognize unusual skills or types of intelligence other than the traditional verbal and logic skills that we focus on? How can they know if their child has a special aptitude in some other if area? If you allow your child opportunities to explore and try different things and follow his interests, chances are you're gonna find out whether he's interested in music or art or, some, or books or anything. The thing is, parents have to learn to watch children carefully and allow them to explore, give them the freedom to try, to make mistakes and to deal with their errors. And in so doing, I think the sensitive parent is gonna spot the kid who's a musical or mathematical okay. or whatever. All right, on that nicely eloquent note, we will end our discussion. I thank you all for joining us. That is our report for tonight. I'm Dr. Timothy Johnson in New York. For all of us here at ABC News, Good night. This has been ABC News Nightline. If you wish a printed transcript of this or any Nightline broadcast, please send $3 to Nightline Transcripts, 2 John Street, New York, New York, 10038. Nightline is a presentation of ABC News. Tomorrow. Come on, David. The new moonlighting you've been waiting for. Muddy and big. Don't let that moment of excitement prevent you from being careful, okay? Then... Make room for Headroom. The premiere of Max Headroom. Right after Moon Moon. Moonlight. Moonlight. Tomorrow. Tonight... Tonight a very serious thing happened to this family. They lost their most precious possession, their three-year-old daughter. When fire strikes, don't panic. You've got to help those who can't help themselves. The old ones and the young ones. 
We've got to make sure they're safe before they're sorry. A fire safety message from the National Fire Information Council. Have a problem? Can't find help? Call Contact Harrisburg. We owe a lot to the writers of the Gospels. Without their writings, we'd know almost nothing about the life and the teachings of our Lord. The writer of the first Gospel was a man named John Mark. He wrote in Rome about A.D. 65 at the insistence of the church at Rome. When he wrote, Peter had just died. People were concerned that what Peter had taught about Jesus would soon be forgotten or would be diluted by time. The, the church prevailed upon John Mark, a young protege of Peter's, to write what he remembered. Now, John Mark was a poor grammarian. He had no formal education. His writing in Greek is often hard to translate, but he was willing. And parts of his gospel were copied by better trained writers later, like Matthew and Luke. His willingness to do the best he could produced the first Christian gospel, and millions have believed because of what he wrote. This has been Thought for Today, brought to you by WHTM-TV. WHTM-TV Incorporated, Channel 27, now concludes broadcasting operations. WHTM-TV Incorporated, covering Harrisburg, York, Lancaster, and Lebanon, is owned and operated by Smith Broadcasting Company, with studios at 3235 Hoffman Street in Harrisburg. The transmitter is located in East Pennsboro Township, Cumberland County, west of U.S. Highway No. 11 and north of State Highway No. 944. WHTM-TV Incorporated broadcasts within the frequency band of 548 to 554 megahertz with visual power of 1,000 kilowatts. Have a good night.